That has made all the difference in our own lives, hasn't it? Amen? Mm -hmm. And it can make all the difference in the lives of individuals around us today, too. But what about America? Well, that's what I mean by the word society here in the last page of the notes. If you were to read in Isaiah <coughs> chapter 3, verses 1 through 15, something we did do this last Friday in the evening, you'll find some challenging, difficult, but challenging verses, full of some sarcasm, some real sharp elbow digs into Judaism to God's chosen people. It's full of insinuation from God, you are corruptors, there's no integrity, you are compromisers. And as you read, Isaiah chapter 3, verses 1 through 15, maybe you would join me in the thought of the question in my own mind, is this as much about America as it was then about Israel, about Judaism? Well, on us today, is there justice? Is there righteousness? And then I think, does God's people, do God's people have a passion? I wonder, do we have a passion anymore? I mean, you're saying you're too old, you think. And you would say, I'm too old to have a passion, Pastor. No, you're not. No. And maybe some of the snotty nosed young kids around us who we expect to have passion are waiting for someone of age and maturity and with some experience, but also for sure some devotion to God to give them a, a model to what might be lived. We are living, frankly, as believers' lives of mediocrity. I feel it myself. And I declare to you the status quo is not sufficient. It is untenable. It is unacceptable. It must not be. It must change. No more excuses. About your own life. Is it full of excuses? Is it full of excuse? Are you big one, one big walking excuse? I've come to believe after a while that, frankly, one of the signs of maturity is not having to feel like you have to have an excuse for everything you do. Try to live so you don't have to, and there's no temptation to excuse given. You know what? We have reasons, don't we? We can talk ourselves out of even good sometimes, where God wants us to expend ourselves, to stretch ourselves, and to reach others, and to even to change societies. May I mention Wesley again, that Wesley was born into a Christian family, never became a Christian, though, until he was well into his adult years. But it changed everything, like it changed the Apostle Paul's life. And then for decades, he lived into his 80s, often by horseback, a quarter of a million miles by horseback, going from place to place, preaching the gospel, starting his meetings, Started what became Methodism uh, and reaching and preaching and out of doors mainly, unaccepted by his church of his day, out of doors and an offscouring to many in his own nation, but changing lives, changing society. And many look at Britain and they say in the timeline of the story of Britain, England before Wesley, England after Wesley. I ask you this morning in your own life, on a personal level, yes, think about your church, though, your church's history. How about Woodside Baptist? Before John Smith, after John Smith Christian. What about with friendships and reaching wider, maybe a, a Samaria kind of view of Jerusalem, Samaria, Judea, Samaria, etc. Reaching others, seeing other lives change. Is it hopeless? No, it's not hopeless. Before Wesley, after Wesley, 200 years ago. Might there not be something yet someone in this room, maybe one of our youngsters, maybe one of our more mature types, maybe us, that might be useful in God's hand to effect a change. Things need changing, things need changing. America! I love Woodside. I don't ever want to live anywhere else, frankly. I pled with God, if you ever send me someplace else, please send me someplace else in New York City. I love New York City. I care about this place. I'll tell you what, I'm not proud of our bars and our social life. Woodside is known for its Irish bars, Sunnyside for its Irish bars.
Sundays I get up early to get those bagels we eat in the other room. And I'm on the street and I walk past a bar or two. And I see what they've deposited on the sidewalk and how their clientele has thrown up over this and over that. And I think about ruined homes and I think about the cost and I wish Oh God, I wish it was different, for I love my town. I think of New York, I like New York. I'm a Northeasterner, I know it. I'm a New Englander if I move north. Not south, not south, no! Hey listen, New York has something called off-track betting. New York is paying its way, they think, by a lottery. I want to tell you this morning, please, Christian, don't support off-track betting. Do not support the lottery. Don't be a contributor to that which is frankly destroying left and right. This week in the news, $300 million given by, these are federal bucks, our tax money, $300 million given, I believe it's annually, to Planned Parenthood. I, I wish everyone in this room would read George Grant, Grand Illusion, the story of Planned Parenthood, and how it's starting people started it as an eugenics effort to cleanse the race, frankly, to get rid of anybody that they perceived of as being inferior, and mostly in their minds, that was the black race. I can't understand how in New York City we have a huge number of abortions and the precious black race. These among us are the greatest victims of it. And yet they support them. And they're killing their own. Something should be done. Something must be done. On a personal level, the answer is my God and this book. On a church level, this great God and his book, his gift to us. Oh, the individual needs of people around us. This book, this great God, he's the answer. And for America and for this world today, I know it's very romantic. It's very, very an idealist thought. But I think very good biblical. There is hope because of this book. And this great God. How bad are things? I'm a former school teacher. I say former with great joy because I don't ever want to be a public school teacher again. I think I'm reaching that happy age where I can say I'm never going to do a few things. And one of them is I'll never go back to teaching public school again. Oh, I hope it's not how I envy you your happy days at school. And we have about half a dozen different school teachers in our room. Whoa. Pray for our teachers. Right. Here's something I found a couple of years ago. It's about three quarters of the way down the second page. It's a question from a kid's test published by New York State. Have you already read it? You see the significance of my putting it in here? Let me read it. Maybe you can figure out the answer. Listen close. The question is short. After running in a 100 meter race, Pedro is breathing faster than he was before the race. Pedro's breathing faster after the race is an example of A, an animal changing as it grows. B, an animal changing to meet its immediate needs. C, an animal changing as the seasons change. D, an animal depending on other animals to meet its needs. Now which answer is right? Forget, don't worry about it. Did you notice how all the options begin an animal, an animal, an animal, an animal? This is taken right from a test developed by New York State for fourth graders. Our children are being taught. They're being taught that we're nothing more than animals. And the repercussions of that are, are there need, is there place, is there expectation, morally? Can we wonder that our children subjected 
overall, not just this, but overall, in a time and place in a sphere in which it's hardly possible to mention the name God without controversy. And a time of day in which there are all sorts of subtle teachings and things that lead to biblical apostasy, frankly. One of the most fundamental, fundamental things we need to believe and must believe is that a human being is different from an animal. And we are different. And we are under this great God who has expectation for us. And there are morals. And there are, there is judgment. My friends, our own state, our city, our country. Franklin Delano Roosevelt said, a day that will live in England. I would really like to thank you that this was not quite that bad on a wider scale, though, for our nation, for our city, for our state. Is this a day, a time of infamy, of horror? And I, myself, I think, again, the status quo, I can't, we must not let things stay as they are. It is untenable. It is unacceptable. And I will not allow for myself more excuses. How about you this morning? I think again about New York, Mexico City. I think the only hope for each of those steps, beginning with me, is my own time, my own worship for God, of God. And that not because I'm forced to be, say I'm a pastor, so I must do that. There is joy and benefit, and it's my choice when I love it and grow increasingly passionate about it. Why then, as I'm part of the church, that will be, with others no doubt, with others, a means of seeing that church advance spiritually and then effectively for God. It will be the means, one step of the means, of reaching and changing other lives that are as tragic as they're as heavy ways. And it will <coughs> affect, on a broader scale, neighbors and friends and co-workers as we seeking God, our sound in Him, and put God in his word as number one in our lives. And as that happens, and more widely, it can affect. John Wesley's day saw it. It can affect our own day. And our own children's future. It must. Mexico City... I've had those thoughts for 20 years. It's apparently still going to have to wait. But you know what? The truth is, it, it's what we are ourselves and along with God. It's what we are when we take that strength, that power, and that motivation, that passion to the next level our church. And then ministering and serving among others more widely. And then, with others, of course, ministering and seeing the change in our own nation, our own day.
And I pray, Lord, for consciences to be pricked, for self and doubt and uh, sin, Lord, even, to be rebuked and fled from. And Lord, we pray for a grasping, a grabbing, a laying a hold of Thee, O God. And Lord, intimacy, friendship, intimacy. Lord, time with You, Your Word, spiritual, loving, fellowship. This is what we were made for. This is the way to live today. Our Father, we pray your blessing. Continue to work in our hearts. Help us not to be without the very best of your plan for us. I pray this, O God, in the name of Jesus Christ, who would not be deterred, who went right to the cross. He was going to fulfill his Father's will, no matter what. Make us to be that passionate. Our God, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.